exist one the same way. You have to get you got to lean into it. So that's why I'm using this one better. Okay. Good morning, Lakeside. Good morning, Lakeside. Good to see all of you here today. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Tom Stewart. For those of you that do know me, I apologize in advance. <laughs> no. We on, Chuck? I am, I am the third string quarterback. Robert and Karen are down in Central Texas at a family reunion, so Robert asked if I would stand in for him. David and Kay are not here. They're at home. Say hi to them. Hi. Kay is still getting over COVID, and she's kind of struggling through there just a little bit, it, but it's getting better, tested uh, negative, I believe on Friday, so that was good for her. I have one question for all of you before we get started, and that is, of course, Robert gave me some jokes to tell in his absence. My question is, do you want to hear it? 
Robert, I'm sorry. The audience has spoken. And I'm not going against them. I'm here and you're not. The first thing I want to do is um, have Phyllis Fortenberry come up. Where is it? Phyllis is right here. She's going to talk a little bit about um, uh, Christmas in July program. Summer Santa. Good morning. I'm Phyllis Fortenberry and I'm a member of the auction committee. I want to visit with you this morning about Summer Santa and explain a little bit about that to our new members and kind of remind us that those that participated last year that um, what's that, what Summer Santa is all about. The Lakeside class raises money each year for local missions for the Lindale and Tyler area. And our biggest fundraiser is an auction the first December, or the first Monday in December. And this year it's December the 5th. The auction has two parts. It's a silent auction and it's also a live auction. Now the committee purchases items throughout the year where we can get the best um, uh, prices, like if there's sales. We also uh, shop seasonal items. We try to find the, the items that are unique, items that you would be interested in. Now, in order to purchase these items, we have to have funds, and that's where Summer, Summer Santa comes in. Summer Santa is an opportunity for you to donate money where we can purchase these items, and Summer Santa will be the last three Sundays in July, starting today. So if you want to donate today or next Sunday or the next, or if you want to donate all three Sundays, that would be great. Uh, if you're making out a check, we need Vanna Claus to come. <laughs> if you're going to make out a check, you will um, <laughs> make it out to the church and make sure that in the memo that you put Summer Santa, where they'll make sure the money's in the correct account. <laughs> okay. Okay. We have a we have a little video of, to kind of show you what the auction is all about. Does anyone have any questions about the Summer Santa? Yes. It was a good bird feeder though, and the the squirrels cannot get in it, and the squirrels can't get in it, can they? That one, that bird feeder came from Colorado. So even when we're out on our trips, we always are, are shopping for the auction. So, okay. <laughs> oh. Starting bid's gonna be fifty dollars. Do I have fifty dollars for this thing? Nineteen is fifty dollars. Do I have sixty dollars? Number thirty-six. Do I have seventy dollars? Number twenty-seven. Do I have eighty dollars? Number nineteen. Do I have ninety dollars for someone? Ninety dollars for number thirty-six. Do I have a hundred dollars for number nineteen? Do I have a hundred and ten? Who's in the back? Oh, what number is that, Pat? Uh, Mary, forty-five. Do I have a hundred and twenty? Thirty-four. Do I have a hundred thirty? Thirty-six. Do I have a hundred forty? Nineteen. One hundred fifty. I need a hundred fifty. Number fifty-three. Do I have a hundred sixty? I need a hundred sixty. 160, number 45, 170, 170, number 53, 180. Right there. Go 
Going once. Going twice. 200. Uh oh, 210, number 53. Do I have 220? <laughs> 210, number 53. Going once. Going, oh, 220. Going once, going twice, sold. Was that, <laughs> that fast enough? <laughs> okay, number, item number 35. Two pies and a Betty Evans. Two pie ladies sat together on the right side. Oh, that was it, I think. Okay. So the, the teacher in me just has to come out. There's three things you have to remember. That Summer Santa is for donating money to purchase the items for the auction. It's, it's, the, <laughs> it's the last three Sundays in July. Uh, when you make out your check, make sure the memo says Summer Santa, or if you give cash, just make sure you tag it Summer Santa. And the most important thing is to um, save the date, December the 5th. And I encourage you to, to participate in Summer Santa. It's a, um, the auction itself is a great time of fellowship. And it's a lot of lo lots and lots of laughter. But the most important thing is that it raises money for special organizations. And these organizations meet the needs of, of many people in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. I don't know if any of you saw on the video there, I was a shelf, I was an elf on the shelf. <laughs> so was Rupert, so was Jerry Youngman, and Diana passing out the, you're an elf, Elfette. She was. Well, I, I was sitting on my shelf, that's why, you know. <laughs> a few announcements here today before we get started with Rupert. Uh, the Ladies Bible Study, uh, uh, their program is entitled Prayer. They'll be meeting this Thursday morning, 1030, but they'll be meeting here in the Lakeside class instead of the Lodge, which is where it was last week. They had 64 women there at the... Uh, um, the study last week, so they moved to here so it could accommodate the more people. Uh, number two, treats today are provided by Pam Kale and by Carolyn Jackson. So we want to thank them for that. We have birthdays. I want to recognize, we mentioned it last week, and it was Kay's birthday. Kay is our Vanna White who Showed you the check, but she's also the Vanna White there at the uh, auction itself. But Kay turned 80. It's hard to believe that. <laughs> hey, it's common knowledge. <laughs> My story about Kay, though, you'll love this one, Kay. We were there at the Vacation Bible School. Kay called me over. Her and Janet were there, the nurses for the kids. Kay called me over and said, uh, you know, I had a shirt, had a t-shirt, and it said on the shirt, yes, I'm a nurse. No, I don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so when Kay sees me, she always looks at me and says, no, I don't want to see it. <laughs> Birthdays, other than Kay, Martha Sorrells, Martha's here, her birthday's on the 17th. Uh, Don Skinner, and Sam, I think Sam's here, Sam Sockwell. Their birthdays are this week. I think they're on the 20th, is that correct? All right. And Betty Kennedy and Wes Oregon, their birthdays are July the 22nd. Are they here? There's Betty. Is Wes here? 21 to Betty, all right. Anniversaries, uh, Doug and Karen Danley, are they here? Uh, their anniversary is on the 22nd. A um, couple things on a sad note for us, a good note on, for them, is the loss of Brenda Ilter. The service was yesterday, very good service, and Joe Stovall. 
uh, we're going to miss Joe. Joe was a, a, a great individual uh, who did a lot for the organization of this church and will be missed sorely. But kudos to him for where he is today. Uh, the thing also on Joe's, Joe's service will be Wednesday. It'll be, I think, 1030 in the morning. Is that right? Um, the church will be preparing a meal for his family. So if you're willing to prepare a dish or a dessert, you can let Phyllis Fortenberry or call the office and talk to Karen. Let them know that you'd be able to do that. But that'll be on Wednesday, Wednesday morning. Another birthday, I just saw this in uh, some of the readings I did here this week, Doc Severinsen. Do y'all remember Doc? Doc turned 95 years old on July the 7th, and he's still playing. Can you believe that? There's one thing that I also saw a friend of mine that lives down in South Texas sent to me, and it was called Advice from a Tree. These are not jokes, so Glenn. <laughs> Advice from a tree. Stand tall and be proud. Go out on a limb. Remember your roots. Drink plenty of water. Be content with your natural beauty. And enjoy the view. <laughs> Rupert. You're up. Now, visitors, visitors. Oh, I'm sorry. Visitors, visitors. We have Norma Willis and Andrew McNeil. They here? They still here? <laughs> they, they stay? Is there anybody else that I may have missed that's a visitor here today? Well, we thank you for being here with us. Rupert, it's up to you. I, lo I love Rupert's famous line, and that is, Janice, where are we? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm, let's see if I'm on here. Good morning, church family. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, I'm getting out there then. <laughs> well, we got the baseball all-star game coming up this week. It's time for home run derby. The Rangers are going to be there next week. <laughs> Can't seem to get a home run, but, but um, it's time for the break of the season. Halfway through baseball, Mac, have you enjoyed it so far? Well, good fill in for football. <laughs> <laughs> fill in for football. Well, that's a lot of truth there. Long hard season, but uh, the Rangers are having a little tough luck here right now. But uh, maybe we'll come out. Swinging. When did that start? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, All Star game coming up this week. Patty, you can, you got any All Star breaks? Any All Star players you're going to be pulling for? No, but my son probably does. Yeah. I'll be yeah. seeing him this week. So. Yeah. <laughs> you're going, going on vacation? California. 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 How many people other, other than Patty have vacation plans in the next two weeks? There's some over there. There's some over here. Okay. Sylvia back there on the back row. Well, <clears throat> we had a, uh, a chance to get away uh, a couple weeks ago up in Crested Butte. You know, it's bad. You Somebody has to be there to endure 45-degree weather. It's tough. It's, it's tough. tough, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway... This morning, we're starting a, a new series. We ended up the, the book of Acts last week. And uh, so, right or wrong, indifferent or whatever, you know, I don't have an agenda to, to, to pick by, so I picked the book of Daniel. And I think that in the uh, next uh, month, month and a half, we'll, uh, we'll be talking about some of the um, things in the future things to be looking at, some things that have passed since uh, the book of Daniel, and some things to look forward to, and so it's um, my thoughts on, uh, on Daniel. Uh, we're going to get into some of the uh, uh, future plans, future uh, 
prognostications about what's going to happen because, you know, when you go to the bookstore, uh, there's always a different version on what's going to happen in the future. And I love to play that, and I'd like to do some of that this week. But um, am, I, am I okay, Chuck? Am I sounding good? Okay. Okay, well, I'm going to make sure I'm getting out there. We've had a little microphone problems this week, but we're enduring that. But anyway, the book of Daniel. So many different versions are written about things to come in the future. And we're getting closer and closer to the, the coming of the Lord. I am assured of it. And as you read the book of Daniel, we'll, we'll see and we'll put some of the numbers together, how uh, the book of Daniel uh, talks about, you know, the 70 weeks a lot to the coming of the Messiah. And uh, um, he's already come. And now we're, uh, you know, while he was here on earth, we're, now we look forward to the second coming. Hallelujah. 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 So um, the book of Daniel, we talk a little bit about, uh, is written from the, uh, the city of, of uh, it's about the city of, of Babylon. And we have a lot of history from uh, Babylon. We know a lot, quite a bit about it. So I wanted to get got a few things. You know, Babylon was called the ancient, the, the, uh, the wonder city of the ancient world. And um, in the Babylonian Empire, the uh, man that's running that is a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, he come, comes to his office as a, uh, right after his father had, had, had done a lot of the hard work of being victorious over a lot of different countries, a lot of different cities. But Babylon is centered over here in the cradle, really, in the cradle of, of civilization. And uh, Babylon is here, and it has gone by a lot of names. It's a very, it was a very old city, and uh, um, further in the New Testament, we know of it as uh, the Tower of Babel was in Babylon. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar will, will reign from some 45 years, but at the very height of Babylon's influence, David was there. Not David, excuse me. Daniel. What am I doing? Did I say David all along? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> oh, me. Daniel. Well, good, good. And uh, I was looking at that, and Babylon is laid out in a series of, it's a big square, and it has the Euphrates River running right basically through it. The Euphrates breaks it into two parts, and in the city, it is really a square that's fenced off. It's a 60-mile square, and it's 15 miles on each side that runs down on all four sides. And it has a wall that it stood at, that, at the height of it, 300 feet high and 80 feet thick. <coughs> and that height on that went into the ground 35 feet deep so that no one could get under the wall, 35 feet. And it's built with bricks, one foot squares, three and four inches thick, but a foot square. It has a hundred gates of brass. It has a temple there to Murdoch and Baal and Ishtar and all of these different shrines that are set up in there. And it is um, even the Hanging Gardens of Babylon was built by Nebuchadnezzar for his wife who was taken from a Persian king and she just wasn't happy with the surroundings and wanted more East Texas trees. <laughs> so he built her a hanging garden and it's full of lush plants. It's called one of the wonders of the world. It's a city of gold. There's 53 temples to different gods in, at that time in Babylon. And um, it has a uh, center table that is shared by a lot of these different ones. And it is, weighs 55 tons. 
where it's encased in gold. And Nebuchadnezzar is the, is the king of this, of this. You see, he's just about got it made, doesn't he? What could be better than Babylon? And besides being a fierce warrior and being able to have an army that can conquer other cities, other, other civilizations at the drop of a hat, he's also very intelligent. He's a militant and he has everything going his way. And he is brought out in Jewish history. Why is he in the Bible? Why is Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible? He's there because he is thought of as the answer for the punishment of the Jews when they have finally slipped to their lowest point. Nebuchadnezzar is the one that comes in, attacks Judah, and takes it hostage. Now at that day and time, when you conquer a country, what would we do today? If you conquer a country, what do we do? Yeah, we give them money and rebuild it. <laughs> good, good answer. Or we put a flag up and we build an embassy and we call this ours and the people stay there and then they're under a new dynasty and a new ruler. At that day and time, that what was done is that once you conquer something, you come in and you take the people back to your land. And that's where this morning's story starts in with the book of Daniel. The war is over. Jerusalem has fallen. And the people are carried away in some three different waves to the land of Babylon. And in that first wave, you have Daniel and some of his uh, strongest friends who are really, I'm going to say, uh, teenage boys. Who are those friends with him? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they are friends, and they are, and these friends, I noticed that the, when they said they came and took the ones in the first wave, they took the ones that were good looking, no defects, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom endowed with their understanding and discerning knowledge and with the ability of serving the king in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach him all the literature of the Chaldeans. So they become Babylonians. Babylonians. Some things you can teach, but there's other things you just can't change. And that's the spirit of the Lord when it deep dropped down deep into Daniel all four of them are faithful people, faithful Jewish boys from the tribe of Judah, all taken there at one time, and all of them love the Lord. Well, they're over that, and Daniel is assigned the job of a, here's a wise man. And they're grouped in with astrologers, ones that can fortune tell, very intelligent individuals, stargazers with the ability to foresee, and his three friends have those gifts, or at least one of the gifts, and Daniel goes, and Daniel has been given a unique gift that he can Interpret dreams. Goodness gracious. Can you see how this would... Now, the, the Jews are in bondage. They're over in Babylon. And through the next few weeks, we'll read more and more about the life of Daniel. But can you see how Daniel would be there to train the other wise men? In fact, after this morning's lesson, he will be put in charge of the wise men. Now, when we hear of the wise men, what do we think of? Christmas and the Christmas story. And you remember these are the same wise men, the same area, Babylon, and from the same cradle of civilization, 
that on that faithful Christmas, when they spot that star in the sky, what are they doing? Half of them are stargazers, astrologers, and when they see that star, they know to do what? And I want to assure you this morning that through the teaching of Daniel, he has got them all well-versed about the coming Messiah. Again, the Lord has used that part. We forget about it, but at Christmas, those stargazers over from that part of the world, that's the reason they know, because Daniel has already told them about the coming Messiah. Keep your eyes open. Be watchful. He's coming. 700 years later, that teaching comes through, and those same stargazers see that star, and that's the reason they'll follow it. Now, the Jewish people have already come home. The star is shining brightly out in the field right out outside of the town. Did they go? No. They have to wait for people 700 miles to come across the desert to get there. That's the reason we know that the wise men, they didn't get there that night, did they? And Jesus is about a year and a half old when, when they do get there. Okay, stargazers, Babylon. By the way, uh, Babylon today has been destroyed, and there's really very few artifacts to be found in, in Babylon. Now, the bricks from Babylon have been carried off and set up to build the streets of Baghdad. And the only thing from, I can, I'll get you some pictures next week, of the ruins of Babylon have been pretty much destroyed today in our lifetime because you see you have uh, Saddam Hussein who thought he was the reincarnated Nebuchadnezzar. And he has managed to destroy everything else and put into his palace, and of course we know his faith, and while he was carried off and, and found out by the American troops. Babylon is gone. It's just, as Isaiah said, the howling of the jackals will be heard in Babylon. It's where a place where wild owls nest now. There's nothing left, just the ruins that are left civilization. But after as great as that was, our Lord still lives on. And we still worship Him today. Just as Isaiah said it would happen, it came to pass. And this morning we're looking at Daniel while he's in the zenith of that magnitude. By the way, Baghdad is centered, as if that edifice wasn't large enough and huge enough, Outside of its walls, it had a one-fourth of a mile water that circled the whole thing. It was a moat. It had 13 bridges, and at the end of the day, those bridges were pulled in. No one can come in. You've got to be able to swim the moat, go 35 feet in the ground under the wall to get in. It was considered a fortress, invincible. But yet today, owls and jackals haunt the ruins. Okay, Dan Daniel. So, when Daniel is in the first chapter, these four boys come in, and the king wants to set them and set their presence about what they should, how they should act, and how what could conduct they should do. And the first thing you do, Daniel said, I'm not going to eat the food. I'm not going to eat the food. Was, it, was there something wrong with the food? No, being from a, a Jewish background, what was wrong with the food? You didn't know what it was going to be. It could be a lot of pork. But also, it had already been sacrificed, most likely, to one of those pagan idols. And... Jewish boy can't eat something that has been sacrificed to a pagan god, 
and also because of the what it was to eat. Can you see a, a hog head on a plate? And that's what you had, Janet? Look at that. Yeah. No, he said. So I tell you what, I want you to feed us nothing but vegetables and water. And I tell you what, I'm going to get the guard and I will want 10 days of, <coughs> 10 days of vegetable and water. And then you make your own assumptions about the quality and how we look and what we've done. So the guards granted his wish and they gave him vegetables and water for 10 days. Charlie, you, you part of this? Can you eat vegetables and water? I mean to tell you, vegetables, you know, they better be frying up some okra for me or something. French fries or something, you know. So I don't know if I could eat vegetables and water for 10 days. Ann, how about you? I don't think so. <laughs> Katie? I, I've done it, but I don't like it. You don't like it? It no. depends on how hungry you are. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick, vegetables and water, can you go for it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. We're not talking about fried okra now, but <laughs> french fries. <laughs> Squash, turnip greens. But you know what happened after the 10 days? They came to the garden. Guess what? They were more alert, looked better. The more healthy appearance than the other ones. Does that give us a clue about what we should do today? <laughs> Notice he didn't say you get a vegetables with a big gulp. He didn't say we can get a, a big uh, Diet Coke. Did he? Seven up? No, water, water, the simple things of life. And guess what? It turned out to be the best. What the Lord provided from the beginning. I'm like you, it would be hard to put up with that for 10 days, but anyway, they were very nutritious. And all of the four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, all the boys, and Daniel has the gift of interpreting dreams. Well, wouldn't you know chapter two comes up and Nebuchadnezzar is in this palace and at night he has a dream. So he don't he wants it interpreted. He's scared of the dream. It scared him. So he goes to the wise men, he goes to the astrologers, he goes to the magicians, he goes to all of those parts that's supposed to know, the wisest people of the land, and he says, I want to know about that dream. And they say, Well, sure, tell us what your dream was. And we will tell you what it means. Now you can see that, and the more you think about it, that's a trick question, isn't it? How many TV shows you got about once you lay out a story, how many people are going to add on to a story? Roll it around, interpret it a different way. We've got all, do you ever notice that any kind of accident or anything, but time they, the accident just happened a few seconds, but time all the interpreters get through with it, the news goes on and on. Well, he said, no, I'm not going to do that, but here's the kick of it. I want, to, I want you not only, I'm not going to tell you what my dream was. I want you to tell me what my dream was. I want you to tell me, Sam, what I dreamed, and then interpret it for me. And they all said, that can't be done. That can't be done. How are we going to do that? You got to tell us the dream. Buddy, you got to you got to tell us and then we'll spin it for you. No, you gotta figure that yourself. No. Yeah, you got to you gotta tell me what I dreamed and then interpret it for me. And they said, Well, there's nobody on this earth can do that. And then, he, then Nebuchadnezzar said, Well then it'll cost you your life. Because I'm gonna kill every one of you. Because you're no no advantage to me. I, if you call yourself a wise man, if you stargaze, if you if you know so much about the future, you tell me what I dream. And of course they can't. And so 
the guards are already on their way to kill the wise men when they get to Daniel. And Daniel says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can we put this off? Can we, like we would all, can we talk about this a little bit? And they told the problem with the king. And, the, and it's, I noticed that that very afternoon, he went to his four, to his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they talked it over. And they said, listen, let's fall down on her. Let's go to the Lord. Let's see if we can discern this. See if we can understand this. And that very night, the answer came to Daniel in his dreams. That very night. So he went to the guard and he said, set up a meeting with the king. And he goes in and he is very savvy on the way that he handles that. He tells Nebuchadnezzar, he says, you're the greatest king that ever lived. Everybody wants to hear that, don't they? You're the smartest king that ever lived. You're the best king that ever lived. Let me tell you what you dreamed. You dreamed of a, of a, a great image of a man standing up high with a head of gold and a chest of bronze, excuse me, of silver, and legs and a torso of bronze. And it went down and then to your toes, you had clay and iron in them. And then there was a great rock that fell out and came from the mountains, and we don't know who threw that rock, but the rock fell right on his toe down here, and that great image fell and collapsed, and the wind came up, crushed it to pieces, and then the wind blew it all away like the chaff on a threshing floor. It's gone. Can you see Nebuchadnezzar's eyes? That's exactly what I dreamed. What does it mean? And then he explains to them that you, the Babylonian Empire, and you, Nebuchadnezzar, is the greatest of great, uh, you're the greatest of all time kings. But as great as you are, you're still mortal. And one of these days, your empire is going to fade away, and you will be replaced. And then that empire will come, and it will serve its time, and it will be replaced. And again, another and another. Well, I want you to know, to this day and time, there has been four empires that have come and gone. The Babylonians were crushed in 70 years, you know the scripture, by the Persians. The Persians will last for about 200 years, and they will be taken over by Alexander the Great, Greeks. And then, after the Greek Empire, there'll be a splitting up, of, and then you will have the Roman Empire. There's four of them. And that fifth one was coming, but you know what? We've seen the four, but we have not seen the fifth. And where that rock is going to fall on that foot is made out of clay and iron. And you can find the libraries full of interpretation telling you about those ten toes. The ten toes on that huge mon uh, man that's standing there is one of them Russia, is one of them the United States, is, 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 or, or is one of them Iran. Is, what is it going to be? And there's interpretations that goes on and on and on about the empires that are coming. I don't know. We're going to speculate a little bit this week, or next week, about the coming. Who do you think will be? Or is the fifth kingdom the final kingdom? <coughs> is it just the Messiah, and are we just waiting for the minute that he arrives that will last forever? The Bible says we're going to or Daniel says that there's going to be five. I kind of think that something's going to happen. 
but that one may be the shortest of all. And then our Lord will come. And we'll look at some of those predictions in this book, in this heavenly book of Daniel. Well, it didn't take, ooh, at 10.30, man. I'll go for another five minutes here. There was Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar quickly set up out on the plains in Babylon this huge image, 90 feet tall, with his hands spread out, so that every time on a certain, whatever time of the day he speculates, when you hear the music, when you hear, hear the orchestra play, when you hear the sound, you are to fall down on your knees and to worship that image. And people do. Except there are a few deeply devoted Jews that came from there in bondage all the time they won't bow down and well everybody else bow down but David how's that going to make us feel when we won't when we just stand up and point our fingers and try to blend in with the with the community it didn't take long for the wise men to turn on each other some astrologers they said wait a minute there's these over here, we're bowing down, we're praying to this great image, 90 feet tall, nine feet wide. Well, you got these young, young whippersnappers, and they won't bow down. Well, something's got to be done with them. And who were those young boys? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so Nebuchadnezzar will pull them in and say, I'm going to give you one more chance. You could either bow down or die. And what do those boys say? Bring it on. Bring it on. Because we don't worship false idols. We know who the living God is and we worship Him. Oh, me. This is your last chance. No. And if we die, we die. But at least we will have the content knowing that we served, served our God. Heat the furnace up. Turn it up. Nebuchadnezzar is furious. You know that fire that's burning out there, Jim? I want it seven times hotter. Seven times hotter. And, and I want the coals put in that. I mean to tell you, I want a fire here. And buddy, you need these young boys, so that I can show you something, I want you to tie them together. Tie them up. And, and Mike, I want you to put on all their clothes. I want their tunics on. I want all of their, all of their street clothes on. I want you to put them all together, and we're going to put them in there. And the fire was so hot, Mike, that the soldiers going up to the furnace were consumed by the fire in the action of throwing them in. That's hot. <clears throat> they weren't in the furnace. They were taking them up to be thrown in, and they perished. Into the fire they go. And guess what? Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and he says, Wasn't there three of them? I count four individuals in that fire, and Mike, didn't I tell you to tie them up? What kind of guard are you here? Didn't I tell you to tie them up and throw them in there? And who's that fourth one in there walking? You know, they're not burning up. They're in there walking around. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We got... What's going on here, Carl? There's four of them in there. Lord sent an angel. He was in that fire. They were protecting those boys. So they pulled them out. I don't know how you pull them out of the furnace. <laughs> Who's going to go in and get them? But I guess you have to let the fire burn down. Out they came. And the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel, their clothes weren't even burned. 
They weren't scorched. They didn't have a burn on them. And in fact, they didn't even smell smoke. And it's Nebuchadnezzar that falls down and worships them. Oh, oh the, your heavenly God is, is better, is stronger. But here's what I also notice. He allowed them to have a temple for this God, but he did not forsake his gods. God Almighty, the one that we worship today, became one of the other ones. And Nebuchadnezzar will still be there. But Nebuchadnezzar will have more tests in his life, and that's another day, another story. Application. When things don't even look right, when things are not right, have enough gumption, have enough nerve to tell people, this is a mistake. Stand up for our Lord. Sometimes we see things going on, don't we? I don't mean to be to cause a right, but when you see something that is obviously wrong, today and today we are very slow to say to call out a wrong. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. We have to stand firm and say that is not right. That is not the way that the Lord intended this. Because today, we have so many people that just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, well, uh, well what is that to me? I'm going, well, let's just go on with it. If that's the way it is, that's the way it is. But we have to make a stand, don't we? Like Lewis was saying, are we going to mutter or are we going to matter? I like the 17th and 18th verse in this thing. It's kind of key. He says, our God's going to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to serve the stinking God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even if we're consumed by the fire, we're still going to do it. Y'all yeah. ponder that this week. And uh, look forward to seeing y'all next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for the many blessings you give us, Father. And Father, help us to, uh, to uh, come together, and when something is not right, Father, to call things out. And Father, uh, we pray especially for Joe's family this week. Father, be with them as they mourn the loss of Joe and, um, and our loss too. Father, uh, be with us through the week. Help us in everything we do and say that we may glorify you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Rupert. Janice, are you going to yes. fill us in? I'm like Tom. I'm the backup to the backup. Um, Karen and uh, Joy are out of town, and we'll talk about Joy again in a minute. Before I start, I need to put out a request. We have a need for uh, someone, it can be anybody, to take Betty Dixon and Randy on the 27th to a, the hospital. Randy's going to have some back surgery. All you have to do is drop them off. Um, if anybody could do that, it'll be kind of early morning. Uh, it's on Wednesday, July 27th, correct, Betty? Let her know if you're able to do that. Um, okay. Uh, this has been a rough week, guys, as you know. Um, First, we have uh, Mike Biggs. He was the teacher of the Saints Alive, and he is um, now in a, they're looking for a long-term care facility. He has deep dementia, and they're requesting no visitors. He was, uh, he's been released to Primrose Memory Care. Uh, Belva, your son-in-law, how is, Okay, he's in the hospital with severe idiopathic pancreatitis and in a lot of pain. So we need to remember them and Belva. Uh, the Lessler's daughter, who we prayed for before with the thyroid eye disease, they say it has returned. And um, she is going to be getting infu infusions to cover a second round. Uh, her eye is still swollen, causing pain, double vision. And she also has pal palsy on that side of her face. Oh, okay, Joy is not here. 
because uh, Doris Tomlinson, her mom, had a uh, stroke, and she is in hospice care. We all know Doris. She was our water aerobics teacher there for a while, um, and so she's uh, asking us to join praying for her journey to be with Jesus, to be quick and peaceful and quick. Okay, Denny DeWitt, Rupert and I went about a week ago and visited him in hospice. I don't think that was the right placement for him. Uh, but anyway, he has now uh, been moved to Health South. I think it's called something different now. In room 133B for rehab, they're requesting no visitors at this time. And then, of course, we have, um, uh, we've lost Brenda and Joe this week. Uh, we need to remember to be with, um, pray that, to be with their families and because uh, it's going to be a tough road ahead we have joe's service wednesday we had brenda's yesterday it was beautiful and also lewis's mother-in-law uh, shalice's mom is in her last days with dementia and before i pray i want to read uh, this uh, yesterday lewis talked about hope and grief at brenda's service hope without grief is unsustainable and will not withstand the day of incurable pain. Grief without hope is uninformed and forgets the resurrected Christ. But grief and hope engaged on parallel tracks of faith off, offer breathing room for the bereaved and solace for the mourner. We cry the tears and do not forsake them. We remember our hope and do not refuse its comforts. And in this bittersweet exchange of raw emotion and memory, we hear the tender whispers of Christ's consolations. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy in John 16, 22. Let's pray. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, he was on his way yes. home. Okay, start. Okay, we've got to hear you. So he was attacked, you said, yes. and given some kind of drug. And where was this at? In, I mean, in Memphis. Oh, okay, Memphis. Okay. Okay. So your y'all your grandson was attacked and um, given some kind of drug, but he's getting care now, and police are involved now. Okay. Well, we'll definitely remember that. Thanks for sharing that. So we need to remember that. It's a sad story. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Okay.
Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we thank you that you are the great physician, that you um, love us, care about each one of these that, that we mentioned today. Um, pray for these two families that are uh, grieving the loss of their loved ones. Just hold them up in these coming days that will be very difficult. Um, and we pray for uh, all these needs, these physical needs and for the Turvin's grandson who really needs you right now just lift them all up and surround them with your love and your caring arms and just um, let them feel your presence God and we thank you for who you are and that you do, do promise um, your love and your caring and that you'll never leave us we ask in Christ's name amen thank you Janice thank everybody for being here today